Well, I walked into a hospital room the other day, and a family was gathered at a bedside, and one had placed an iPhone on the patient's pillow. And surprisingly, I heard the familiar sound of the bagpipes coming out of the iPhone. It was a great recording, and in case you're not aware, if you are Scottish or of Scottish descent or Northern Irish Scottish descent, um, bagpipes are used to pick people up, to get the blood pumping, to, to I don't know, bolster them in battle or get them ready for sport or whatever it is they face. The bagpipes, when they're played, they give those people uh, a little something extra. Story two, I only did one year of high school in Canada back when they had grade 13. And um, one of the curious things that I remember uh, in that first week of grade 13 was that on Friday afternoon, they had a pep rally for the football team that was going to play later in the afternoon. And the school community gathered in the gym, the cheerleaders, they're doing their thing, the band's out playing, and there are speakers and the coach just drumming up uh, support, and um, they, the, there, there was this sort of electricity in the air, and I'd never seen anything like it, unless someone was playing bagpipes. But um, the, the atmosphere was, was just electric, and then they started, um, it, before there was such a thing as political correctness, they started in doing these chants that would put down the other, you know, they would kill the other team. And there was one that went something like, come seven, come 11, rickety, rackety, shanty town, who can knock our Broncos down? Nobody, nobody, nobody. And the whole place went nuts over this, and people were cheering and hollering and encouraging the team. And it was like a battle cry, and everybody was pumped. And... You know, it may be bagpipes in Northern Ireland or Scotland or a pep rally in a Canadian high school of yesteryear. I'm not sure they do that anymore. But uh, these things can give us a little something extra to get the blood bumping, motivate us, help us to face life's battles. Story three. Over the past uh, month, if you've been with us uh, each Sunday, we've been looking at some of the stories and truths that come out of the books of Samuel. And Samuel essentially outlines the rise of Samuel as the last judge and then the rise of the monarchy in Israel. And we looked, uh, for instance, a couple of weeks ago at Saul, and uh, then we looked at Samuel's anointing of David. Uh, last time. Well, David's accession to the throne was a very slow one. It was drawn out. It was in the latter decades of the 11th century BC, and uh, that's even further away, George, than that hymn. Um, and uh, and uh, anyway, Saul was still the king, and David um, accepted that, and he honored Saul's office because he too was anointed by uh, God and Samuel. Um, but the presence of the Lord, you'll remember, uh, was taken away from Saul. And he was said to have experienced an evil spirit, and this evil spirit got him down. And as you read the text, you feel like he's depressed or something. And uh, the only thing that would help him was a little music, sort of soothed his soul. And they found somebody who played a harp. His name was David. And David came into the service of Saul, but just part-time. The rest of the time, he would be out in the fields with his uh, father's sheep and looking after them. Well, when Saul was okay, he was out trying to look after the Philistines. And with the Lord taking his presence away from Saul, uh, the Philistines were again causing great difficulties for Israel, and there were repeated incursions into their land. 
and um, the problem was growing and growing. And today's story is of, of uh, a great Philistine army encamped against Israel. And they were strong, and they were many, and they had one champion, a great man, a giant of a man, like bigger than Shaquille O'Neal, huge. And Goliath, he came, comes from a town from, named Gath, which was a little few miles north and east of current Gaza. And uh, Goliath was a, this, this seasoned warrior, fierce, fierce man. And he wore this helmet of bronze, and he had this coat of, of mail made of bronze, protective mail, and uh, then uh, heavy protective gear on his, his legs and his arms. And, and we're actually at the tail end of the Bronze Age, and he had this javelin that was heavy, heavy javelin made, uh, the head of it was made of bronze, but Goliath was right on the, the current stuff, and he had uh, a sword and a spear that were the latest weaponry, iron, iron. And uh, day by day, Goliath would come out, and he would walk out from the camp of the Philistines, and he would face the Israelites, and he would taunt them. And he said, haven't you come here to fight? You're all sitting up there doing nothing. Haven't you come to fight? Why don't one of you come down and fight me? And I'll tell you what, if you fight me and you beat me, then all of Philistia will serve you. But if I win, you will serve us. And he would taunt them and taunt them. And who dares come fight me? And the Israelites, they would just look at Goliath. And it's like Shaquille O'Neal, as I said. You're looking at this massive man and nobody wanted to take on this nasty animal. And uh, so they're filled with fear. Meanwhile, young David is out in the fields. And David is looking after the, Jesse's sheep. And Jesse called him in one day and he said, referred to the fact that several of his brothers were out encamped against the Philistines. They were serving in Saul's army. And he instructed David to take them some food and drink. So David went. And he took the food, and he took the drink, and he happened, as, as just as he was there, he happened to hear Goliath. Goliath comes out, and uh, he, it's one of his episodes, and he taunts the Israelites, and David saw the men turn away in fear, and, and he said to those around him, Who's this Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, an interesting little addition here. I have a friend who grew up in the Salvation Army, and she married a Jew. And the Jew was a very Jewish Jew and a very uh, uh, held Israel in great favor. And she shared with me one time that he viewed the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, as the arm of God. And I thought it was a curious sort of statement to view an army as the arm of God until I read this. This goes back a long way. David says, who's this Philistine that he should defy? The armies of the living God. And uh, so David, he went to Saul. And uh, he said, well, if no one else is going to do it, I'll take on Goliath. And Saul says to him, oh, come on, you're just a boy. He's a seasoned soldier and he's fierce. And David said, well, that may be true, but I've worked in the fields looking after my dad's sheep. And I've had to deal with bears and lions and I've torn them apart. And I said, he's going to be just like one of those bears or lions. And Saul said to David, well... Go, may the Lord be with you. And so Saul got his people to put on some armor on David. And he got a, a helmet of bronze and he got that mail to protect his body. And Saul found a sword to give to him. And David just felt the weight of it all. He could barely move. So he threw it all off. 
And he went out in just his tunic and he took his staff in his hand and he gathered five stones from the brook and put them in his pouch and he took his sling and he walked out to meet Goliath. And Goliath's waiting for somebody. And when he saw the young David come out, he walked out to him and he yelled, Am I a dog that you come with me, come to me with sticks? And he cursed David by the gods and he said, Come to me and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the animals of the field. And, and David responds, as we have read there, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you've defied. This very day, the Lord is going to give you into my hand so that all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel. The battle is the Lord's. As Goliath moved forward, David started to run towards him and he took a stone out of his pouch and he put it in a sling and he slung it just as some Palestinian youths are doing today. And he slung that, uh, at that uh, stone at, uh, at Goliath and it hit him right in the forehead and Goliath went down and David, we're told, finished him off with the sword, uh, his Goliath sword. And uh, the Philistines, all those that were encamped around, they took off, they scattered, their champion was dead, and the reputation of David began to grow and grow among the people of Israel. Great victory that day, a young lad against a giant of a man. And the storyteller conveys us that that David went into that battle with more oomph than he could get from bagpipes and perhaps more motivation than a high school pep rally. David went into battle with the Lord. He said, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you, Bashem Adonai Tzavot, with the Lord of hosts. In the name of the Lord of hosts. Now, like other key verses in these stories, it reminded me of a theme that actually runs through the Old Testament and even into the New Testament. It runs through what we call wisdom literature, and it's amply uh, spoken of in the New Testament when Paul says to us in that great chapter, Romans chapter 8, says, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? And David had the Lord in his heart, and the Lord was with him. You know, it's a Wonderful thing to feel that the Lord is with you. And I remember as a, a young Christian, uh, my faith was greatly um, encouraged when, when I prayed and uh, got an answer to prayer. And I remember feeling that, yeah, the Lord is with me. And my faith was, would just grow and would get stronger. And... Um, Trouble was that as I continued in Christian faith, I found that life wasn't always like that. I'm going to change gears here for a moment. Life isn't always like that. I had this friend uh, in those early days, and this friend contracted cancer. And I can remember praying for him and being in a group of people as we prayed for him, and we prayed and prayed that God would give him back health. And he died. And you've no idea how much that rocked my world and my young faith at the time. And yes, there are sometimes we feel God with us, like David, but there are other times 
when we feel that God is absent and we're sort of alone in the world. And uh, there are several writers in the Bible that experience times like this, and they would speak of God in very different terms to those that we've just encountered the story of David and Goliath. And they would talk about the hiddenness of God and they would cry out, some of the psalmists will cry out, where are you, Lord? What are you doing? My enemies are upon me, or I, I'm, I'm dying from illness, whatever. Where are you? When I was in seminary, I took a course on wisdom literature, and I, I put this to the professor because he was talking about the blessings of walking with God and with God you would be blessed. And um, I said uh, to him, yeah, well, it's, it's all well and good to follow the Lord and have the Lord in your heart and take God's word seriously and, and to have no other gods be singular in your devotion to God. But there are times when even when all those things are in place, still the Lord seems absent. And I told him about my friend dying from cancer and I remember John Oswalt, uh, he was very thoughtful, and he said that he had experienced similar things in his own life, and he had seen suffering, and he said, yes, we can look for God, but sometimes it's difficult, and we, we can't find God, but... The thrust of these wisdom books is that it is always better with God than without God. They don't say that we're not going to encounter struggles and issues in life, but regardless of what we face, it's better with God than without God. And I remember going through a few dark nights of the soul about that whole issue and trying to figure it all out. And I wanted God to be with me like he was with David so that we could do all these marvelous things all the time. Um, but sometimes that just wasn't happening. And there came a time when I had to come to terms with the fact that our human minds are finite, and even mine is. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll never know some things and whys and but sometimes pastoral ministry can teach. There was a lovely woman in the church I served in Markham, and I had dinner with her and her husband um, uh, several times before she contracted cancer. And uh, she wound up, things went downhill very quickly, and she wound up in hospital. And I remember having a conversation with her one afternoon and she said, I, I want to share something with you that I'll never tell my family. She said, uh, sometimes the pain is unbearable. And I said, well, what about painkillers and drugs? And she said, sometimes it is above those. And she said, in those times, I pray and God gets me through. I thought about that statement quite a number of times since then. I pray and God gets me through. And it struck me, perhaps that's what John Oswald, Dr. Oswald was talking about in that wisdom literature at class, that we may experience bad things in life. We're not spared from those things, but it's still better to be with God than be without God because... As all have said, God will get me through. God gets us through. You know, our world's a complex place. And what we incur in life, it's filled with complexities. But with God and just knowing that the Lord is with you, even in the midst of darkness, even in the valley of the shadows, it can give you a measure of hope and um, a presence that gives us that 
little something extra. It, it's more than bagpipes. It's more than a pep rally. It's God. And sometimes we'll have victories like David. Sometimes we'll struggle. But as David says again and again, the battle is the Lord's, and sometimes God just gets us through until heaven's door is open. Let us pray. Lord God, we come before you today. We come before one, and there is nothing in this earth that compares to your likeness. You alone are from everlasting to everlasting. And the one who brought all things into being. You know when we sit down and when we rise up, your knowledge is vast, wonderful, something that we can't attain. But it's because that you are so far above us that we come to you in awe and in worship. And we come at times with our requests when we are in need. We've been reading today about your great power to help those who walk with you, to help those who hold you dear in their hearts. And we've read about how you were the king of your, or you, were, you were a king who rose, uh, took others in the nation of Israel and brought them up as, as kings, people of old. And uh, we thank you for the stories of David and the example that that he gives to us. Where we walk with you, O oh God, we ask for your blessing. And yet we realize that life can be complex at times and many times we'll encounter difficulty. Sometimes it's our own. Sometimes it's with our loved ones. And we, we realize there are times when we, we don't feel your presence and we desire it. But we can't find it. And when we walk through the dark valleys, we pray that you would help us to continue to trust. We pray that you would help us to understand and perhaps get that little bit extra that will strengthen us or sustain us through whatever we face and give us grace. Lord, be with us, whether the days are good or whether the days are difficult. We ask for your presence. And we pray that we can all hold in our hearts that picture, the greater picture of life that lies around us, not only physical life, but a spiritual life. And uh, no matter what he went through, Paul could, could hold this life and be encouraged by it. Lord, encourage us in, in dark days. Build us up in the days that are good. We pray for our world today. We have been thinking this week on our televisions, we're been told about some terrible things going on with immigrants in the United States and separation of families. And we pray that uh, American lawmakers would get this sorted out. But in the near term, we do hope and pray that families would be reunified and that particularly young children would find their mothers and their fathers and feel the safety of their arms. We pray, too, for the remainder of this service as we approach you in communion in a few moments. Lord, help us to truly commune with you. May your spirit speak to our spirits. May we be encouraged for life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.